Awesome. Well, that sounds like a plan. Uh, I will take that opportunity then to say, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your Liberty Radio on a Tuesday night. Uh, I know the uh, programming format is a little bit different from what you guys have been accustomed to. No live request show tonight, but hopefully uh, this one will be every bit of the crowd favorite as what the Tuesday night show usually is. It is our great fortune this evening to be joined in the Liberty Radio studio by none other than author, researcher, podcaster, uh, what other titles can we throw in there, Terry? Former TikToker. Former uh, TikToker. I got banned uh, without warning. I mean, I still have a TikTok account that I technically could make. It has like 125,000 followers, but uh, all the momentum is dead. They banned my account. Now I'm shadow banned and I can't get any viewers on my videos if I make any more. But I had a good swing there for, for about a year and a half. Oh, wow. So how long is, uh, how long is the account been down for? Uh, it was banned in late 2021, I think. Um, and uh, then that, that's when I stopped to uh, take a break and write Fire in the Rabbit Hole, which is the, the second book on this sort of topic of this uh, weird culture war, religious war that we're in. And um, because what I saw on TikTok was so alarming and so interesting to me that I wanted to dig into it and actually write a book on it. So I got banned and then I quickly wrote Fire in the Rabbit Hole, um, which is not an in-depth survey, but it is, it has proven to be very relevant and becomes more relevant as we go on because of all the warning signs I saw there on TikTok where I was getting thousands of direct messages and comments and stuff like that every week that people were just pouring in and and uh, trying to induct me into their astrological cults or promote witchcraft or uh, <laughs> whatever it was, uh, some sort of every kind of flat earth and everything you could imagine under the sun was pouring into my inbox in my comment section. So I'm like, okay, this is this is enough good research that I can, uh, I did still connect dots and it has a very strong through line a, and some connections in the book that I don't see other people making about where all this is coming from and where it's all leading to. But um, It started off as just basically being inundated by completely seemingly random left field cults and kooks and scammers and, uh, you know, mystics and shamans and druids and everything you could imagine. So like what what type of communication were you getting from these people? How were they approaching you? Oh, TikTok was, I mean, at least on my account, I had gotten big enough my main thing that I was doing was promoting my other book, Maybe Everyone is Wrong, which is this in-depth study of revelation and my interpretation of how it has been unfolding over thousands of years. It's not just this one big event at the end of the world that everybody thinks it is. Um, And so I was promoting that and I was doing something nobody else was doing, which was a like it ended up being a 140 part series. If, if anybody uses TikTok, that is unheard of. Nobody has ever done that before or since to have a 140 part series that sequentially goes from one to the next. And so um, I was building an audience where people were demanding, Let, I want the next part, where's the next part? And I'm like, okay, this is what happens in Revelation chapter six. <laughs> and then I'd like, I'd get into the specifics there. It's a very strange following I had in that sense. But what would happen is I, I got big enough that when I commented on other people's videos and I make a response video to somebody else's, let's say I see like some some new ager who talks about, you know, um, changing your vibrational status and your consciousness to be able to manifest, uh, you know, the, the destiny you want and that kind of thing. That's a very common thing you'd see, at least I would see in my algorithm. Um, I'd make a response video and that would have enough weight that their following would start suddenly like it would have a shockwave effect right so i was kind of like an influencer on there and so it would actually send out a shockwave and now all their followers would come in and defend that person or attack me and that kind of stuff so it was really a war zone and i i love that kind of stuff i had a lot of fun with it but um (laughs) it was it was the kind of thing where it's like suddenly i have like practicing witches talking about putting hexes on me and uh saying that they were going to you know, curse me and whatever. And the next person would be saying that I misunderstood the whole thing. And it's really just about love and about 
whatever they'd soften it and try to spin it in different ways and stuff so i got it's it was love really cool. hex they wanted to put a love <laughs> hex on you yeah they didn't quite reconcile how it worked with the other people that were were cursing me literally trying to put curses on me i guess but uh um, yeah, it was, it was that it was a furnace of just chaos. Of, and, and I thrive in that environment. You know, I, I like to do my own private research on the side and quietly do my nerdy research. But, um, I also love being in the cauldron of, uh, debate and, and having these people come out of the woodwork because they reveal so much when they attack you, you know, it's like, um, uh, and so that's where I learned a lot. And I realized how serious it is that this isn't just, I mean, it's mostly people LARPing. You know, they're not really witches. They're they're just idiots online who wish that they were somehow mystical and had some sort of power and stuff. Uh, that's really what the neo pagan witchcraft thing is: is people larping and uh, pretending that they're uh, powerful and interesting. But uh, at the same time, it reveals a lot about pop culture and how far we've slid from the what you would have thought we were at 10, 15 years ago. Um, there's a whole generation of people who are totally comfortable um, and it bleeds really heavily into Christianity where you have a version of Christianity. Like I'm a Christian I study the Bible and stuff. It, it bleeds really heavily into that. And then it, you start to get forms of Christianity. that are about positivity and manifesting and the same exact things, but it's done from this point of view that, Oh, you're, you're getting God to do it for you. And so then it's, it's different. It's Christian. It's, and Jesus sort of did the same thing. You're basically just copying what Jesus did. He, you know, had faith and he believed in miracles and this, and so they really tried to bleed it together. And that bothered me too. So I, I had to push back on that. Um, so yeah, ever since then I've been, I was sort of schooled, uh, by all of that. And, um, that pushed me out the door to really take it seriously. So it sounds as though you've encountered, I would say, a fair number of the different groups mm -hmm. uh, that are that are out there that we could put under the new age umbrella. Is that fair right. to say? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the the groups are really um, specialized in their own little fields. Uh, so they seem very different, but um, the thing about the new age, as as we will explain as we you know get deeper into it, is not um, a thousand separate movements pulling in different directions. They're all pulling in the same direction uh, without admitting it or even in many cases realizing it. It's designed to not even that the members and the people who are doing it don't even realize what they're a part of. Um, and so it's a very sneaky, movement uh, that disguises its real intentions so where would you recommend uh for for an audience that may not be well acquainted with this subject matter um because obviously i i know quite a bit due to my own research and you know quite a bit more than i do uh, which is why you're here tonight um, our audience i have no idea what their foundation is and where they're coming from so let's assume that they don't really know anything at all. They, they've they never mm. heard uh, the word theosophy before. They don't know who Alice right. Bailey is. They don't know who Helena Blavatsky is. They might have heard of Aleister Crowley, maybe. Yeah, I think there's two names that most people have probably heard that are that are surprisingly relevant. Most people wouldn't realize how relevant they are. One of them is H.G. Wells, who's the famous science fiction author, wrote the invisible man and you know uh the the mars invades you know story and a war of the worlds um and um just like a dozen other major science fiction things that people he's very famous hg wells um and the other one is is aldous huxley you know brave new world um these guys are british intellectuals at the turn of the century um you know late 1800s early 1900s who were not really science fiction authors. They were using science fiction to push through agendas um, and to raise a certain awareness and push culture in a certain direction and to help shape public policy. And the interesting thing about that for me is that um, H.G. Wells 
ends up writing um, a book. Let me just make sure I have it, uh, the full title. Uh, it's called The Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution. Okay, so if, if you don't know anything about anything, you can look up H.G. Wells' Open Conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution, it's published in 1928. And um, it was written sort of, you know, when he was already a middle-aged man and, and had seen a bunch of stuff and kind of become jaded. And he stopped being so optimistic about the future. His utopian sort of vision was sort of fading. And then he decides um, he basically needs to create a blueprint, which is right in the title, for how to achieve world socialism without um, having to basically have anyone agree with it. Uh, without having the consent of the people and so you have this idea and that become hg wells again people don't realize this is one of the most influential political thinkers of the 1800s and early 1900s you know it ends up shaping this whole uh globalist movement and so what we're seeing today is basically a callback i think hg wells sets the model for what we're currently seeing in the, the push for globalism uh, United Nations and these things. He is not the originator, but he revolutionized how to do it through this open conspiracy concept where you have um, you have all of these influential politicians, economic, uh, ec economists, business people, financiers, bankers, uh, military people, all these people collaborating or conspiring, as the title you know suggests, on this project to transform society, to leak it into public policy and change things. Now, where this connects with the new age is that his, his understanding was really um, atheistic, materialistic, policy-based, and based on sort of enlightenment, renaissance principles. It wasn't new age at all. And then Aldous Huxley, uh, basically after he writes brave new world as from what i can tell uh goes and joins a new age cult in america he's like in california uh doing drugs and doing psychedelics and, and really Having getting a good into time yeah yeah he's really getting uh, enlightened you could say and um he basically says okay there needs to be a spiritual element to all of this and so between the two of them behind the scenes as they're influencing very, because they're some of the most well-known intellectuals in the world at that time, and they still are today. So that's how you can tell their legacy uh, was because they were so popular. They basically, com and you combine their views and you have a spiritualized version of the open conspiracy. And, uh, you know, I've said before, I think this is a good way of sort of introducing the concept is that there's like three major female figures that also build up to what we now call the new age and we re would recognize as the new age. One of them is Helena Blavatsky, a Russian mystic in the 1800s before World War I. Um, she writes, she establishes the Theosophical Society. It's a very Illuminati-like small group of you know intellectuals. I don't mean Illuminati as in the world's most powerful people, which is sort of a a misunderstanding of what the Illuminati even is, but um, it's more of just a, a small group of intellectuals who plan on shaping the future. And that's pre-World War I. Then World War I happens, it really doesn't manifest into anything. Her dreams of this revolution, spiritual revolution, that's very Eastern mystic, uh, sort of all religions are the same, all religions the, the, the slogan of the Theosophical Society is that there's no religion higher than truth. And so it's like this idea that all religions have this shared mystic underpinning that connects them all. After World War I, between World War I and II, you have Alice Bailey, who is coins the term New Age, um, or at least popularizes it, and really pushes this idea of the Aquarian Age and the Aquarian Conspiracy um and the new age and so that's where we talk about the new age what even is the new age it is the aquarian age so if you ever hear somebody say new age but you don't know what the aquarian 
age is in astrological terms, like that's one of the things we need to update people on is that new age is not a catch all umbrella term for just any kind of mysticism. Right. It's a specific reference to this idea of an astrological changing of the time of the world from the Piscean age to the Aquarian age. And they argue that Jesus, Jesus Christ was the forerunner of the Piscean age where things became very emotional and gentle and um, they have a bunch of negative connotations with it too. And then they build up this idea that that was just a temporary time period. It's not actually the Messiah. It's not actually, you know, Christian prophecy is not true and this stuff. They undermine that side of things, but then they, so they kind of acknowledge that Jesus had his time. And then the Aquarian age is meant to come in and replace that and usher in this new age where everyone can be Jesus. Everyone can be a, a mystic. We now all become Christ-like. We have what they call a Christ consciousness. And so they're always trying to elevate our consciousness to this next level where we can be an ascended master. If you've ever heard that term, it's one of these guru mystic terms for somebody who has transcended the material world and they can freely um, project their consciousness into the divine realm and talk with angels and spirits and astral project and all these sort of, you know, paranormal kooky things that you might have heard about. Yeah. Superpowers. They get superpowers. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the more, the, well, speaking of superheroes and superpowers, the, the creators of Marvel comics are almost all uh, new agers and they, Shocker. they believed in this. Stuff. Yeah. Um, a lot of them were Jewish. There's a very strong Jewish element of Kabbalah mysticism. If, if you ever heard of Kabbalah, it is just, it's maybe it's a scary word to some people, but it's actually pretty straightforward. It is just, you know, Judaism, like Christianity, like almost every religion, ends up having a splinter where people go really mystical with it and they start to envision things and turn it into this really cult like mystical thing. That's what Kabbalah is. And so I don't, I can't personally say I've done a, a, a tremendous amount of research into the, beliefs of the Marvel, Stan Lee and these guys, Jack Kirby and all these guys. But um, that seems to be where it is. I read a book on it from, um, I think it's called Turn Off Your Turn Off Your Brain. Let me just, Gary Lackman. Hmm. Or turn, is it Turn Off Your Mind or Turn Off Your Brain? Turn Off Your Mind. Uh, subtitle, The Mystic 60s and the Dark Side of the Age of Aquarius. Um, it's by Gary Lackman. He's one of the best researchers on the New Age. He himself is not a Christian. He's not condemning it. He's just exploring it and finds it fascinating. But the mystic 60s and the dark side of the Age of Aquarius, in there he talks about stuff like how um, in Marvel Comics you have the mutants, right? You have this mm -hmm. idea of the X-Men and the mutants. Um, that's directly taken from New Age conceptions of how mankind will evolve and we'll see new strains of mankind come out. They literally use the term mutant in the new age uh, movement in the sixties. They believed that there would be mutations of mankind that would end up having superpower like things. And they tied in all these astral projection and like, it, it's not even exaggerating to say that Marvel comics is basically an outgrowth of uh, mysticism and the new age movement. There's a book that if it, people really want to dig into that, it's called The Morning of the Magicians, Secret Societies, Conspiracies, and Vanished Civilizations. Uh, this book, I, I don't know the exact page number, but I was reading, flipping through it just the other day to you know refresh myself on this. And they're just openly talking about mutants in here with, with superpowers and how there's going to be uh, another term you'll hear is uh, indigo children, if you've ever heard of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so the idea that there's these children who are going to suddenly appear who have this heightened empathy that goes as far as leading into tele telepathy and the ability yeah. to read minds and um, born into you know, the world at the time of the great awakening in order to usher mankind into the new age. That's the indigo children. I remember hearing about that in the 90s. Really? Okay. I didn't yeah. hear about it until until much later when I was doing oh, this wow. research. 
Uh, I mean, I had, I think Tool did songs about, or Perfect Circle, or somebody did songs about Indigo Children or something. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there is one, uh, I can't remember. can't remember right off the top of my head. Yeah, it's, it's whatever it is. It's literally called Indigo Children. It's one of his bands, and uh, I'm I was a big fan of Tool, and you you know he'd have songs about opening your third eye, and he had that famous track with the Bill Hicks quote about. Uh, it's actually one of the best reference point if you want a pop culture reference is oh, yeah. that Bill Hicks quote of how you know uh, you know everything is an illusion and and the whole universe is just one consciousness exploring itself subjectively. And that uh, you need to take drugs to sort of access this deeper level of awareness and everything. Anyway, so that's that's all bundled into this age of Aquarius idea, the new age where we become closer to gods. And religion stops being something that's that's an institution that has a priesthood that gives you access to this divine realm that it's out there somewhere. It is removed from us. You break all of that down, and then you merge heaven and earth into this uh, divinized mankind state where where everyone has access to mystical and divine things. Um, that's really sort of the deep side of all of this. On the more surface level, after World War II, so Alice Bailey is between World War One and Two. After World War Two is really where things um, most researchers stop looking into um they stop taking it as seriously because it's not as hardcore in a sense as helena blavatsky and alice bailey were uh, but it becomes much more cultural and spread out and it's really um the central book for our current day that people should be studying is called the aquarian conspiracy and that is written by marilyn ferguson who is after World War II, um, during the Cold War, uh, sa saying that there needs to be, the New Age needs to come about, but we can't just hope that people catch on and we can't just, you know, inspire a few individuals here and there and have our, our little friend groups that we get into, which is much more of like an Illuminati thing where you have this network of rich or powerful intellectuals who decide to talk to their friends and it's a really small club that they're in uh, this is much more about spreading out as far as possible planting as many seeds as possible and really cultivating over generations a new age um, and and replacing the old order with a new one and the reason why it's called the aquarian conspiracy is literally because it's a merger of hg wells's open conspiracy with the Aquarian age. So that's a very simple way of taking HG Wells's blueprints for a world revolution, the open conspiracy, which is this idea that it's basically the world economic forum. Everyone knows that that's a very popular, you know, Klaus Schwab and the whole, the elites, Bilderberg and stuff, the elites get together and then they talk to each other and they make public policy in private. And then they go back and they pretend like it's a democratic, um process you know once they get back right. home and they they make their policies right like the that, legislation wasn't already written for them yeah exactly yeah so they th but then these groups these small groups is where they they brainstorm and and you know everyone uh, reveals to each other like what they've been up to and what data they've been gathering and spying on people and all the kind of uh, good stuff that our our overlords like to do for us and um and so you combine the that the open conspiracy with this Aquarian age idea, the mystical revolution, and that's where you get the Aquarian conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson. And so what she says, um, she she lays out basically like a blueprint. The subtitle of the Aquarian conspiracy is personal and social transformation in the 1980s. At least that was the. Um, the, the original version was was that's the subtitle because they really wanted to push for this in the 1980s um, and then uh, it got a bunch of negative attention especially from evangelical Christians and then they sort of backed off and became much more secret about it it's or I should say subtle it's not that it's secret it's that it's subtle and there's there's a distinction there where 
it's not that they really want to hide this. It's just that they don't want to publicize it. And so um, it's more discreet. I have right. a physical copy that you can get a new version of um, that is called Personal and Social Transformation in Our Time. They changed the subtitle. So it's not the 1980s anymore. It's just in our time. And which is a much better subtitle, in my opinion. You yeah. Know. I mean, it leaves it open, right? You can. Right. Now it's any time. That's right. Um, and it's still ongoing. And so I, there's quotes from here that might help people realize where this connects to reality. Where is Because it? it really feels like a pie in the sky, crazy, nonsensical idea. When I first heard it, I was like, this has no chance of ever succeeding. Like, you're going to you're going to talk to so many different groups that eventually society will just change into this mystical shamanistic you know enlightenment thing and churches will just collapse and stuff like it's just it's so far removed from reality that it doesn't seem like it's possible that, but that is exactly uh my thoughts whenever i read alice bailey mm -hmm. i'm like this yeah. this woman is just batshit crazy and blavatsky is even more crazy in some ways i mean she's like the original but she it was really this attempt to create this lore, I guess you could call it this, like, you know, if you're familiar with Dungeons and Dragons and like fantasy games and mm -hmm. whatever, it's like, it feels like you're reading the backstory of some insane lore for a role playing game or something like that. It doesn't feel like somebody's trying to actually influence real people in real life. Um, because you, you're just every rational instinct just kicks back against it. And you're like, okay, this person is crazy. Um, so, Let's just take some snippets from uh, the Aquarian Conspiracy. Uh, I have a, a PDF here uh, with some highlights. So keep in mind, this is written in 1980, right? So the references are all going to be dated. But um, she's talking about how uh, she didn't want to use the term conspiracy at first because it has negative associations. Right. But then uh, she decided to start changing her tune when she saw that the Los Angeles Times carried an account of Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, who is the father of current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Allegedly. <laughs> yes, alleged. <laughs> allegedly. Absolutely. Um, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's speech to the United Nations Habitat Conference in Vancouver, Trudeau quoted from a passage uh, in which the French scientist priest Pierre Teilhard de Chardin urged a conspiracy of love. So who is Pierre Terre de Chardin? He's also a guy nobody's ever heard of. Um, even in research circles who are very close to this material, you'll never hear about this guy. But he was actually almost as influential as H.G. Wells and Aldous Huxley in the, at the same time period. Okay. I know, I know um, what kind of individual we're talking about. He was a Jesuit priest who was makes sense who was uh an evolutionary biologist um he oh, really? actually like brett weinstein <laughs> yeah and he uh, advocated a form of christian mysticism that um really blurred with the theosophy it blurred with this idea that um he so he we'll get some more quotes from from him yet I, I guess but um so he had this major influence even in the 80s which is 50 years later uh you know pierre Terre de chardin is using him as a reference point so you can tell this in these upper level conversations pierre Terre de chardin is one of these go-to reference points that they're still referencing in the 1980s and he wanted a quote unquote conspiracy of love. But then she says that over the next three years, a period of endless research, overthinking, or sorry, rethinking and revisions of this book, the title got around. Um, it invariably, I'm quoting here from her, it invariably provoked a startled, amused reaction as the conspirators recognized themselves and their collusion to change social institutions, modes of problem solving, and distribution of power that's a very if you just think about it that's a very odd thing to start talking about because we already have checks and balances on power we have an electoral process we have representative government 
power to the people, you know, power comes from the bottom up in a, we already have the system. So what are they talking about? How are you going to change the distribution of power? And if you did, wouldn't it just be shifting? You'd have to shift it upward and away from what we currently have. Right. So that's the only place then, to go. And so she says, some signed their letters as co-conspirators in their own words or addressed the correspondence to the Aquarian conspiracy. So apparently this was an organic thing as these people corresponded with each other in physical mailed letters. The internet didn't exist yet. And they were basically university graduates, you know, big thinkers, these types of people getting into positions of power, into cabinets, into administrations, into businesses and military and all these different places. And, but they were all sort of waking up to the same feeling that after World War II, we need to give up on all traditional institutions and revolutionize everything like H.G. Wells called for and merge that with Pierre Char Ter de Chardin's call for this sort of mystified uh, rethinking where you can merge evolutionary biology with Christianity and merge that with Eastern mysticism. And it all sort of blurs together. It's a very Aquarian age concept where you erase all the distinctions between everything and everything sort of becomes a melting pot where um, it's not that we respect your individuality and we respect a diversity of people who disagree and we tolerate each other. It's that we actually start to erase the boundaries between people. And now right. there is no difference between America and Canada and the United Nations and whatever. It's like, it's all one thing. It's right. a global one world movement. Um, I believe, I believe the term is homogenization. Yeah. Okay. Which is where we get the, uh, you know, the meme term globo homo from is the, the global homogenization of right, everything. Right. It's not just because they're fake and gay. <laughs> no, no, but that works too. Yeah. But, um, so yeah, so this is where these people are literally corresponding with each other. So like, I know it sounds like nobody would take this seriously and it sounds crazy. Uh, but these people did not come from Alice Bailey's school of thought and then say, we believe in all this mystical stuff. How can we force it onto mankind? It's more that this was in the drinking water of the 1960s. Um, it was a very hippie drug psychedelic thing that was already happening. And then this wave of graduates, basically what happened to the hippie movement? You know, if you think of it that way, we all know the stereotype of a hippie having sex and, and free love and, you know, drugs and anything you want to do. Well, at some point, those people have to grow up and right. do something. Well, they don't just disappear into the woodworks. I mean, you might find, you know, the the impoverished, you know, hobo who had a great time at Woodstock or something like that. That might be like a stereotype. But a lot of these people actually did grow up, go to college, which at the time was very cheap. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to move up in the world unlike now where they occupy everything and they stop anyone from having any influence. These people had the biggest invitation ever to just go in and screw up the whole world. And so they went and they joined these institutions and then they communicated with each other and the hippies transformed into the Aquarian conspiracy. They start talking to each other about how can we change this institution that's, you know, maybe, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to pick an example, but something that would be very rooted in tradition, um, conventional policies, conventional thinking. And they're like, okay, this is boring. We don't like this. We're the hippies. We want to have this radical transformation of mankind and this great awakening. Maybe we start undermining the mission of this institution. You know, maybe we just one step at a time, we start to muddle the policy making procedure and we get our people into key positions and we fire certain people, we hire certain people. We just get into the woodworks, the middle management of everything, and we start to screw it up and um, and drag it towards the thing we want to do. I mean, that's that's a summary of basically what she's saying in this book. She says in the next page, as the networks grew, the conspiracy became truer with every passing week. Groups seemed to be organizing spontaneously all over the country and abroad. In their announcements and internal communications, they expressed the same conviction. We are in the midst of a great transformation. In this period of cultural awakening, conspirators connected me with other conspirators. 
politicians, stewards of corporate or private wealth. There you have BlackRock, you have the huge hedge funds, the, and we're talking about the eighties when these things were much more like by now we're at the end game of all of this. So it's all right. calcified. It's all very uh, hard and, and fixed in place. But back then it was very loose and there was a lot of weak spots and vulnerabilities in uh, all these institutions. They weren't looking for this. They weren't expecting this. And so these people are taking advantage of a very weakened, open and trusting society. We're very cynical now. They were not that cynical back then. Um, and so stewards of corporate and private wealth, celebrities, professionals trying to change their professions and quote unquote, ordinary people accomplishing miracles of social change. And she goes on to talk about how this was truly an open conspiracy in her own words. And that's a reference to HG Wells, right? So, I mean, or a callback. Yeah, like it's a, it's a callback to, to that because she's not hiding it in this book. It references H.G. Wells many times. She openly says H.G. Wells was the inspiration for this idea of we need to we need to create socialism. We need to create this utopian, not Marxism and not um, certainly not uh, Soviet, you know, socialism, but their own version of socialism, sort of this Anglo-American socialism mm -hmm where it's like you have the big brother in 1984 this is more like big mother it's more like the nanny state where um the government's just going to take care of you you're not competent and responsible enough to take care of yourself so everything needs to have permission and everything needs to have um you know that's the social institutional level but culturally they're these people specific that's hg wells these people want to take that and add in this mystical level, this other layer, because you can't. H.G. Wells's vision didn't click because it lacked the religious and spiritual element. Uh, if you want to change the whole world, you need to account for spirituality because people have this hunger for it. And uh, so this Especially is what's providing at the time that uh, Wells was writing, because, mm -hmm. again, it's a completely different world. When, when he was writing and getting this stuff published to what we live in today. Completely different. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he was foreseeing a lot of the problems of global conflict and, you know, globalization and, and uh, kind of foreseeing world wars. He had, H.G. Wells, if people want to watch something, you can find it for free pretty easily online. There's a movie that H.G. Wells did called... Um, things to come, which is his vision of the future. And it's very interesting to see how he envisioned future at that early time, because you have a world war before there was a world war, um, or at least World War II. I don't know, when was it written or when was it was created? I'm gonna have to look that up. Um, I'm gonna have to look that up myself. I don't know right off the top of my head. Things to come. 1936 36 okay so it was in between we hadn't quite right. gotten to world war ii yet but we were right. well on the path exactly okay that makes sense um and so he's he's has this vision of the future where uh there, the next war the next world war which he's already predicting is going to have uh biological weapons um, that are going to destroy mankind it's going to destroy civilization will be reduced to rubble all the smart people and engineers will die off and not be able to maintain critical infrastructure. Um, the basically this little conspiracy of engineers who do actually see all this coming, basically the people who listen to HG Wells and, and listen, um, they go off and form their own secret society that allows society to collapse. And then they emerge from the shadows and take over the ruins of civilization and um, create their own, world network of engineers who then control mankind's fate and by the end he didn't this is before rocket technology um but he said people will go and colonize other planets and so his version his vision in the story is a giant cannon that will shoot people to the moon <laughs> uh so you know he's working with what he has in his time this is how early we're talking about uh, but he believes mankind is destined to go to space he just 
at the time, a, a giant cannon is the best thing he can think of because rocket technology was not developed yet. And so, hmm. uh, but it's a fascinating. I wonder if a lot maybe of he was not a big fan of airplanes. Yeah, I wonder. Um, but yes, this, this, I mean, that's a lot of material already for people who don't know anything. Well, it's but it's a good this, place to start. Definitely. Yeah. And, and since then, I mean, I'm talking about the source document of this person talking in her own words. That's why I love it because um, once you have, I mean, on page, I can just go to page 49 of her book, at least in the original printing of the book. Um, here's a quote from her. In the open conspiracy, Blueprints for a World Revolution, novelist historian H.G. Wells proposed that the time was nearly ripe for a coalescence of small groups into a flexible network that could spawn global change. All this world is heavy with the promise of greater things, Wells once said. And a day will come one day in an unending succession of days when beings who are now latent in our loins shall stand upon the earth as one stood stands upon a footstool and shall touch the stars. Again, the reference to the stars there. Um, he literally thought we might have to you know, launch people in space with a cannon, but um, space colonization and UFOs, and obviously he writes War of the Worlds. He's very aware that the the whole point of War of the Worlds is to say, what if a global threat emerged that affected all nations at once and it transcended borders? Then we wouldn't have national interests anymore. We would have a collective worldwide interest, and we would have to erase these borders between everyone and have a secret elite, or he would prefer an open elite. Um, an openly ruling benevolent socialist technocracy uh, ruled by scientific elite hmm. who would come out, rule mankind, and do the best thing for everybody. Like, I don't think H.G. Wells literally thought he was a bad person. I think he literally thought this is the solution. Nationalism was becoming such a big threat. And, you know, Germany and their hyper-nationalism, ultra-nationalism taking it too far and all these colonizing countries trying to compete for world resources. He literally thought the solution is to just have a handful of brilliant scientists. He would prefer white Anglo Anglo scientists, the British elite. He comes from the Cecil Rhodes school of thought where the British are the proper uh, custodians of the world and they should be, you know, ruling over the lesser races and stuff like that. Uh, just like Cecil Rhodes and Bertrand Russell and um, a lot of the other guys from that, from that school, um, it's sort of neo-colonialism. It's it's let's take over through our expertise, not just because we are the empire. Let's be the smartest people, and then we can make the right decisions for everyone. We'll limit their diets. We'll control their breeding. We'll treat people like cattle, and you know, breed them for different purposes, and everyone will be happy because that's the that's the new order of things. Get rid of the church. Get rid of this traditional thing where every person has inherent value. And, um, you know, let's look at the world through a scientific lens, uh, a eugenicist, you know, lens, of course. Um, but, you know, that's the background. So here you have in this book, Marilyn Ferguson talking about the Aquarian conspiracy, directly referencing H.G. Wells, talking about how this small group is going to, small network is going to take over everything, one institution at a time. And she's inspired by this um by this idea of change and not only change but change through covert means which is like through a network of people who don't admit what they're doing which is like the definition of a conspiracy right so it's not really a conspiracy theory it's openly admitting that it is and immediately afterwards she talks about carl jung you know a lot, a lot of people understand carl jung um, that's, a, that's a pretty surprisingly, uh, I found that a lot of people are aware of Carl Jung, even though there's no real reason he should be popular. Um, Jordan mm -hmm. Peterson is a disciple of Carl Jung. He's a huge mm -hmm. fan of him. Um, you have a lot of people in the alt media, Joe Rogan, um, Cat Jimmy Williams, Dore. Jimmy Dore. Yes. Um, surprisingly comes out and talks about his Jungian, he hires an, a Jungian mm -hmm. analyst he describes his dreams to a Carl Jung trained dream analyst who then tells him what his dream interprets his dreams for yeah. him. Oh, he's like been, this is, he's been doing shadow work. That's, that's how deep Jimmy is into it. 
exactly. Uh, so Carl Jung is actually in the book. I, I don't know if I have the reference on hand, but I do have the, the quote somewhere. And I can probably find it. Um, she talks about how the two biggest influences on this Aquarian conspiracy, it's not Helena Blavatsky, it's not Alice Bailey, it's not herself. She herself wasn't much of a, uh, a catalyst. She was more of a journalist who then became this fulcrum where these people would connect through. So she was like a networking person, not much of a lore creator like Alice Bailey. Helena Blavatsky would literally channel spiritual beings and you know, if you're a Christian, these are obviously demons. But uh, if you're not, I guess you have to have your own interpretation of what these, what spirits these people were channeling when they wrote these giant books uh, talking about the future of humanity. But anyway, um, you know, she's talking about Carl Jung, and the two biggest influences were Pierre Terre de Chardin, the, this Jesuit priest, and Carl Jung. So mm -hmm. both of them were mystics, but they were not recognized as theosophists or um, belonging to this new age cult per se. Carl Jung presents himself as a psychologist, even though he's a mystic posing as a psychologist. Um, and uh, Pierre Chardin, like Chardin is, is a Jesuit priest. He seems to be working for the Catholic Church and, you know, has this bizarre thing where no one, the Catholic Church doesn't even know what to do with him because he's pushing evolutionary biology, which is heresy to the church. Um, he's he's claiming, I think they're frauds, that uh, he made discoveries in China with his archaeological findings where he claims he found evolutionary missing links and stuff like that. It's a sort of a separate scandal with him. And, um, and then, yeah, Carl Jung is this figure that takes over the psychological uh, aspect of this. And a lot of people who are just interested in psychology end up getting sucked into mysticism through him. And she says immediately after on, on page 49, the same page where she just quoted HG Wells, she talks about Carl Jung and says that, um, you know, some of the things he contributed was a dimension of shared symbols uh, Jimmy Dore talks about that in his, mm -hmm. in his these dream symbols that he sees that then he gets interpreted from his Jungian interpreter. So very contemporary. We're not talking about something that's a million miles away and nobody takes seriously. This is current figures that are talking about this. A dimension of shared symbols and racial memory. So you have this idea of the races uh, having their own cultural and racial epigenetic memories. So every race has the memories of their ancestors encoded in their genes that gets expressed through your unconscious. And so this justifies the eugenic racist technocratic philosophy where the British and certain races are superior and suited to managing the other ones. And the other ones are better suited to hard labor and being more slave-like. And it's like, these are all the undertones of what you get into when you start to study these people and their their writings they are obsessed with race and um you know th there's actually a, a direct connection to uh, the thule society and nazis and hitler as well with the ss and their um obsession with ancient civilizations and the same esoteric stuff the theosophy hitler was basically a theosophist mm -hmm. um so i mean what i like to do is to show that this is has these roots that people can go back to, but then you see it right in your face. Like I saw it on TikTok. When I see it on the people that I'm dealing with, I see Cat Williams go on the Joe Rogan show and talk about the Emerald Tablets mm. and talk about Pymander and Thoth. And I'm like, I've studied that in in a curiosity sense of where where are some of these things coming from? He goes on to Joe Rogan and just starts dropping it like it's a like a He's, he's a believer in in the emerald tablets as being the source of all ancient like wisdom literature and or, and or like having it's, it's no knowledge right like we you you remember being taught about the emerald tab tablets in government school right <laughs> it was like first grade that was when they taught yeah. us right yeah exactly uh so yeah the and it's all being presented as being a very sexy counterculture 
revolutionary sort of change in our thinking where, and that's what bothers me as somebody who talks in the alternative media space, like you do, and like uh, geopolitics and empire. And, you know, so these, these guys that I respect and we talk about these things, um, there's a very low literacy rate on this material. Mm. And so it's very easy to have somebody come on and start talking about these things. Like, like everybody who's listening to this has probably listened to at least one podcast where a guy just comes in and starts casually dropping references to ancient civilizations, maybe, um, you know, probably not the Emerald tablets. That's kind of a deep cut, but, uh, you know, something equivalent to that, these different ancient schools of thought and, they really had it, they really understood and how did they build the pyramids? And actually there was this, you know, mystical practices they used to see these things and to align it with the stars. And then once you start getting into how the pyramids are aligned with the stars, then you get into the procession of the equinox and how it does change from one age to another, the age of Taurus and the age of Capricorn. And now we're in the, we're approaching the age of Aquarius. And so just, you can jump into almost any point and follow the rabbit trail and you'll end up back at the Aquarian conspiracy because that's the design. That's how it's functioned. Um, there's a, a very important, um, I'm actually gonna look it up here. Um, should be able to find it pretty easily. Um, so, but one thing I'll, I'll point out, uh, for folks who may be wondering, like how was it even possible that something like this could have uh, infiltrated society uh, as we know it to the point that it becomes so pervasive that it's really everywhere you turn. Um, Alice Bailey laid that all out perfectly in her work, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, when she said, look, these are the places where we need to stick our agents. All right. And we don't we don't need like everybody in the place. We don't even need 90 percent of the people. We just need like two or three who are yeah. going to be capable of steering the ship for that particular aspect. And we're talking about things like education. We're talking about things like politics. We're talking about things like religion. We're talking about science. We're talking about psychology. We're talking about finance. All right. The, these are things that are engines in our shared human experience. They help us get from point A to point B as a society. This is what these people were infiltrating and co-opting. And once you understand that, it gets a little bit easier wrapping your head around just how big of um a structure this is that we're dealing with because it's literally everywhere yeah and i would just i would just um probably say that it's less of a structure although you know i i understand exactly what you're saying i i struggle to find words to describe it sometimes i i have found that the the better term is a movement it really is a it is a movement of like-minded people who are recruiting each other and guiding each other and that's kind of what i'm going to get into right here because there's a term that uh, i found in this book the aquarian conspiracy that lays out how this works on a more technical level um and it's on uh, if people want to look it up there's pdfs of this book online it's on page 216. Um, it's called a spin s-p-i-n uh, it stands for segmented, polycentric, integrated networks. Segmented meaning they're cut off from each other in a sense. Um, they, they have segments. They're not all one thing. Polycentric meaning there is no one center. Each segment is its own center. Integrated meaning they still do work together and a network. And so what she says is that this is what they're working on um, since the 1960s and says that, uh, I mean, I don't know how much of this to read, but I'll read a, a quote here. Each segment of a spin is self-sufficient. You can't destroy the network by destroying a single leader or some vital organ. The center, the heart, 
of the network is everywhere. A bureaucracy is as weak as its weakest link. In a network, many persons can take over the functions of others. This characteristic is also like the brain's plasticity with an overlap of functions so that new regions can take over for damaged cells. She goes on to say, the Aquarian conspiracy is in effect a spin of spins, a network of many networks aimed at social transformation. The Aquarian conspiracy is indeed loose, segmented, evolutionary, redundant, meaning if one thing fails, another one can take over for it. Its center is everywhere. Although many social movements and mutual help groups, think about that term, mutual help groups, how many different healing centers and even um, all of the obsession with, uh, let's say you've got Reiki, you've got um, all these sort of Chinese and, and Eastern places that always have this sort of uh, chi and spiritual vibe, but they're not really, what, like all, a lot of these places, especially if it's run by like white people who, you know, uh, it's not actually like a direct cultural heritage. It's like co-opted by these new agers. You know, these are mutual help groups um, posing as businesses and stuff like that. And they're trying to recruit you into something. Um, it says, although many social movements and mutual help groups are represented in its alliances, its life does not hinge on any of them. It cannot be disengaged because it is a manifestation of the change in people. And she also says, most people don't see these networks or think that they are conspiracies. So, I mean, that's literally what we're seeing. And it is on a technical level, it is a, a brilliant system for generating more and more pressure on society to change. It's not that it has the mechanisms, the levers to force change in people. I mean, that would be absurd. Uh, even if they produce thousands of TV shows and movies and comic books and, you know, whatever they can do to try to, you know, push this into the consciousness, the awareness of people, they don't have, no, nobody's claiming they have the power to change people into being new agers. But what they can do is occupy so much intellectual mm -hmm. landscape that when they push together on one issue from a million different angles, not, not admitting it, using different terms, uh, using different things to appeal to different people, they'll appeal to the black community in a different way than they'll appeal to young white people. And they'll appeal to inner city people differently than rural people and churches differently than uh, Jewish synagogues or Muslims or whatever. They can target all these people with different tactics, but when they do it all together, it creates this tremendous pressure. And what you see and what I saw on TikTok when I was, you know, at the height of doing that with, uh, I had 220 some thousand followers on TikTok, very active community, very, uh, you know, organic buzz sort of feeling to it, where it's like, People were flooding in and they were interested and we were debating things and it was a very hot debate sort of environment. Uh, I saw this pressure happening in people's lives and they would say, my wife just got into uh, meditation and now she's starting to say that she's having weird dreams and visions and it starts to feel like she's communicating with something else that's not a person and she's like you start to see the warning signs in everyday lives somebody says my daughter is you know i think she's doing witchcraft or something i don't know what it is and it's like you look into it a little bit it's one of these you know she also marilyn ferguson also says this is a movement that has no name she says that it's designed to be anonymous it's designed to be um right right you know, how do you fight something you can't even name they, they don't want to be identified uh, in this way. They would, they're they experts actually at camouflage. Um, they will talk in purely rationalistic, materialistic terms. A lot of the science that you hear about now is actually a cover story for this stuff. The talk about quantum computing and quantum science, 
oh, it's revolutionizing everything, quantum things. It's actually two things can be true at the same time that contradict each other. And, you know, traditional time space doesn't work anymore. We have to throw out all the rules of science, rethink everything from square one. This is just science, people. We're just trust the science. Well, that's all you can read about quantum stuff in the new age literature mm -hmm. in Marilyn Ferguson, in Alice Bailey, uh, in, in a lot of these mystical movements. They were talking about quantum this and that you know, before the current scientific push of for so-called quantum computing and, and quantum physics, um, quantum physics goes back to a guy, you know, around Einstein's time. But uh, what these people are doing is they're taking that over, just like they take over everything. They're, they're hijacking, they hijack different movements and replace the leadership. And then now suddenly it's a new age movement and you didn't even realize that the switch happened. And so it's a very stealth operation that they're doing and you can see it in their own words. It's a spin of spins. It's a, a network of many networks uh, that people don't recognize or think is a conspiracy. And this is why it's so explosive once you start to get into it because you realize you, you will start to recognize this everywhere once you start looking for it. Um, and what seems to be a um, again, I I'll point to somebody like Joe Rogan because he's the, so a huge popular target, um, an easy target to look at. The Joe Rogan experience, third eye, you know, in his forehead and mm -hmm. his logo for his show, um, always promoting psychedelic drugs, talking about being able to have out-of-body experiences and his sensory deprivation tanks and all these practices that, hey, that's just, that's just personal health. That's just this new field of interesting psychological study he he's just a free thinker right he's not part of any network he's not pushing any certain uh, he's agenda just, he's just microdosing every now and then and smoking a lot of weed it's no big deal it's all good it just makes you a funnier comic and you That's can right. just you know you know just loosen up man just stop being so rigid and thinking in such linear terms like get with the quantum programming here you know we can really do anything if we put our mind to it we can just really like and you can see how this is just a gateway for and i think it's like from the start designed i i don't know how much he's like an actual controlled operative that gets you know marching orders from anyone i suspect that he's blackmailed and that he has uh, mm -hmm. a lot of skeletons in his closet personally uh but you know even if it's just completely he's just organically part of this thing that was in california where he was it's a very hollywood you know uh progressive place that he came from um doing all, doing his shows and stuff like that and then you know now he's suddenly conservative and he's like you know he's really representing the conservative angle and stuff it's like yeah right with elon musk right like right just just microdose and well, you know and he just had uh peter thiel on uh within the last week yeah it's like the guy with the biggest military contracts in the world you know the, the running a an ai algorithm business for the cia to, to try to like spy on everybody like it's pre basically a uh, crime agency that's what they are they're a pre-crime agency called palantir which right. is a reference to the lord of the rings the the evil all-seeing orb of the which of is the demon again God. A, another new age theme yes yeah lord of the rings really also got co-opted by by the new age Big and time. also became integrated into this whole thing that's an uh, gary lackman does a wonderful job of that in that book about the dark side of the age of Aquarius, the turn off your mind book. He it's, it's completely about that. And he talks about that along with Marvel and all these other things that, that um, in the sixties, there was this huge revival of interest in Nordic and uh, ancient cultural heritage and Lord of the Rings got slotted in there with all these hippies. And um, they started to look at it with these new eyes, instead of being this fairy tale for the modern age that sort of, this great work of fiction, they, they started to project onto it this new significance, this mystical significance that sort of becomes another, like Helena Blavatsky, it's basically this this lore dump. Um, and Dungeons and Dragons also literally just steals from all of that and is a new age project in itself. Although I've enjoyed playing Dungeons and Dragons in the past and I have no problem with people having fiction and enjoying, I love Lord of the Rings, um, the problem comes in when these people project their demented mystical fantasies onto it and then take it as some sort of um, scripture, really. It's sort of like this 
it's one of many bullshit versions of uh you know because they don't care about the truth right so if you don't care about the truth you don't have to have a consistent message you don't have to agree with each other you don't have to be pushing the same message uh and be cross-examined and then have your your message scrutinized and then people can tell what's true or not none of that matters to these people it's not about mm. establishing one truth that is unassailable and then refining that argument it is about disguising what you're doing as much as possible convoluting it misdirecting people and then through the back end getting them in to cults and movements uh, without them suspecting it and then that's the, when the aquarian age happens um maybe what we should do is is pivot to where this leads in the future uh, because it doesn't lead to just people doing more drugs and you know having more right. mystical experiences right it doesn't it doesn't actually lead to uh, a very good place if if again uh we are to believe that the spirit that was being channeled by alice bailey was in any way accurate right yeah uh, it gets very dark. Uh, Barbara Marks Hubbard is another one. Um, there's some books that I can yes. recommend to people. I was Once I was just listening to uh, one of Jay Dyer's uh, latest podcasts uh, earlier today, and uh, he was referencing uh, Barbara quite heavily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a quote. Um, I, I, I push this book every time I can. I didn't write it. I don't get any royalties from it, but it's my favorite book. It is called The New World Religion by Gary Kaw. Um, this deals with everything that we've been talking about, and it's it's not tremendously long. So if people want to get one-stop shop for everything we're talking about, this talks a lot about Pierre Chardin and um, you know H.G. Wells and everything that we've talked about, Alice Bailey, Levatsky, everything. Um, there's a quote here that I'll try to find. I, I don't have an online version, but I highlighted it here where he quotes from Barbara Marks Hubbard as she is channeling um, some being who has a message for the, the coming age. Here it is. Um, so uh, in the New World Religion, Barbara Hubbard is quoted as saying, as she's channeling some being, we the elders which the elders being the spirit beings, this is actually what Alice Bailey means when she talks about the hierarchy. It's not just a hierarchy of humans. The hierarchy includes demonic beings or these spiritual ascended master beings outside of humanity who are supposed to be guiding. So the hierarchy or the elders, as Barbara Marx Hubbard calls it, is supposed to be guiding this whole movement. It is a spiritual... I mean, any Christian would just recognize this instantly as demonic influence, but, um, you know, Probably again, even I, I, some non-Christians, I would hope that <laughs> I would hope that at some point it would become obvious to non-Christians too. But, uh, here's the quote. We, the elders have been patiently waiting until the very last moment before the quantum transformation. That's the, there's that word quantum again. Well, there's that word transformation again. Uh, yes. They love that word. To take action to cut out this corrupted and corrupting element in the body of humanity. It is like watching a cancer grow. Something must be done before the whole body is destroyed. The self-centered members must be destroyed. And here there's a lot of linguistic games that is being played because in the New Age mentality, if you want to be an individual and have sovereign free rights and human rights and be able to have your own beliefs that don't come from this hierarchy, uh, you are a problem. You are pulling away from the collective. It's all about collectivism. It's all about herd mentality, dragging everyone into this soup where you don't have individuality anymore. It is anti-individualistic. And so you don't get to be self-centered anymore. You have to be cosmic centered or consciousness centered where or planet the grass centered the grass and the stones and the clouds and the stars are all just as valid as you are they have as many rights as you do um if you have to be sacrificed to protect some trees i mean at least the trees survive they're 
you don't have any special rights or value to these people. So it's all this, everything is God and everyone is God and God is everything and nothing at the same time. So it's a lot of word games they play here, but you can decode it pretty easily. Um, so she says the self-centered members must be destroyed, not tolerated, not taught to learn better, um, not educated, destroyed. There is no alternative. So they're ruling out the option of changing people's mind who truly resist this when the time comes. She's talking about this time coming for the quantum transformation. A time is coming when they are going to target and murder people who do not agree with their agenda. Uh, she says, only the God-centered can evolve. Again, the word game here where God is not the God of the Bible. It is not a God that is a righteous judge, ruler that will someday judge humanity and gives all of us some inherent dignity. It is this cosmic consciousness God, the, the pantheistic, uh, mystic God. And if you're God-centered, it means um, you submit your will to this thing this mystical ether that is uh, interpreted by these shamans however they choose to interpret it it is not a scriptural written down thing that anyone can go and examine for themselves it's this ever morphing shape-shifting god concept that they use to justify anything they want to do so the god-centered can evolve but the self-centered person cannot Fortunately, you, dearly beloved, are not responsible for this act. So she's already trying to free people from the guilt of genocide. Um, we are, and she's channeling a demon here, channeling a higher power. She's not talking as Barbara Marks Hubbard. She's talking as the elder that she's channeling, this, this ascended master that she's channeling. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. These are wonderful words of transformation we can all look forward to. He selects. We destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse, death. Wow, this is... <laughs> is anyone signing up? Yeah, That's I mean, a mighty big horse. Yeah. We will use whatever means we must to make this act of destruction <laughs> as quick and painless as possible to the one half of the world who are capable of evolving. Now everything is global and connected. Each person is about to inherit the power of destruction and co-creation. The inner voice, the Don't higher have self. That? Have what? The, the power of co-creation and destruction? I mean, if you count reproduction and, you know, the, I, I would think that uh, that's nothing new, but... Uh, they, again, all of these things are code words. So, um, you know, the power of co-creation and destruction is really about the power to public publish material and uh, access minds and be able to inform people of what's going on in this conspiracy of death and destruction and hypnosis and uh, delusion that they're pushing. Uh, but, you know, they don't want to say it that way. So uh, just this, there's a generic warning about co-creation and, uh, and destruction. The inner voice, the higher self, each person's own connection to God, independent of priest, text, church, or mentor. So I have to specify, we're not talking about Christianity here. This is a different God that they're talking about. Um, must be heard directly. This is the Aquarian idea. There's no mediator between you and God. Jesus is a mediator. He is the one mediator between us and God, the only designated mediator that is acceptable to God. That Get rid of that. We don't have any mediators anymore. Everyone can be their own Christ. They can be their own savior. But you're just a stupid, you know, ignorant, uneducated, uh, you know, Luddite. Yeah. You don't understand how to access this. So you need them to teach you how to do this. They will induct you in and uh, initiate you into the mystic ancient secrets and then you will follow their guidance but you will end up having this supposed connection to god directly and then i'll just finish this like one more sentence here those of you who know what is happening the one-fourth of you now listening to the higher self 
are to be guides for the rest who will be panicked and confused. So, I mean, this is how they actually talk about it behind the scenes when they're channeling these things and they're encouraging their fellow co-conspirators, their Aquarian conspirators. They're trying to already anticipate and and reduce the guilt that they feel for the terrible crimes against humanity that they're planning. Mm. And it all comes around to a certain time that is unspecified where there will be a quantum transformation and the time will be right to basically strike against their obstacles to their to their plan and this ties in with you know sort of a more the much more general conspiracy theory discussion that is happening all the time about critical infrastructure uh being not maintained properly mm -hmm. uh how easy it would be to collapse the electrical grid and destroy food supply chains and even though we have globalism and we have trade routes and we have all this modern technology and such brilliant things to connect all of us and you'd think it would be getting reinforced and improved and made more efficient it's all being allowed to decay and the expertise is being filtered out that's one of the things that dei is for is to mm -hmm. try to force stupid people who are they it's not about actually getting black people or women into positions it's about trying to find the least qualified people Correct. There's there's brilliant black engineers who would fix problems. That's not the guy they pick in DEI. They pick somebody who is going to screw everything up because the actual goal of the Aquarian conspiracy is to, over time, like we've been saying, weaken institutions, weaken everything to the point where it can be collapsed at a moment's notice with a very uh with a very, basically just a good solid push. You can start to collapse everything and create this domino effect of chaos and confusion, which he just said, there will be a time where everyone is confused and panicked. And those one quarter or whatever her number was of people who are initiated and enlightened, they are going to be the guides through the chaos, through the collapse. And this takes us all the way to like the, you know, order of chaos concept, mm -hmm. uh, remaking mankind out of the, the like a phoenix you know rising from the ashes sort of concept these are all mystical code words basically for plunge mankind into an apocalyptic scenario uh, kill off all the undesirables and then seize power take it for yourself and then you know write the new rules of the new age as they're trying to literally call it the aquarian age that they're looking forward to and i believe christians especially bible believing traditional christians who uh you know who don't necessarily need a like i don't believe that christianity should have priests we should have ministers and preachers and whatever but the term priest is a term for somebody who provides a sacrifice who does a sacrifice on an altar specifically um the catholic church and whatever like that's a false form of christianity and they want to have a hierarchy and a priesthood there so i'm talking about more literate bible believing christians who uh, don't need the hierarchy, but still like communities and and this kind of stuff. They don't want an independent church who can think for itself and has their own local leader and uh, deal. The, the community takes care of itself and sort of this traditional form of Christianity, especially in America, where it was very pragmatic and very much about helping a local community uh, grow and and basically resist a lot of these messages because people saw it coming back when Alice Bailey was already talking about it. So mm. certain communities of Christians, they were already insulating themselves from this and warning about it. I grew up hearing about some of this stuff in church and I was like, I don't see it. Where is it? It's not happening. Fast forward 20 years and it's everywhere. I can't get away from it. All of my podcasts are guys doing drugs and talking about Carl Jung and talking about meditating and astral projecting and remote viewing. And I'm like, well, how did this happen? Like, oh, wait, I heard about this when I was a kid. All the my grandparents knew this was going to happen, I guess. And and I didn't listen to them. But um, hmm. this is sort of where it's I believe it's going as a collapse, a giant collapse. This is why you're hearing about the Great Awakening so much. This is why you're hearing about the Great Reset so much. These are two sides of the same coin. Um, it's a it's a false dichotomy. They want you to believe in the Great Awakening and, and, and root for the Great Awakening and 
you know, root against the great reset, but those are actually the same exact concept just from different points of view. Um, the great reset is a collapse followed by a technocracy where you get rid of the constitution, you get rid of human rights, you get rid of all these things like HG Wells wanted, um, the scientific elite that rules everything. The great awakening is the same thing, a mass depopulation event. Mm -hmm. They just want to have the certain, the pedophile elite destroyed and the, the bankers and these certain people, you know, they're hoping that there's going to be this big washing away of the evil. And then they think humanity is going to be liberated in the process. And it's that movement is being led by these Aquarian conspiracy people who again, never want to admit what they're really doing but they're getting into those positions of trust. And that's a big push today is to get these figureheads in position so that when this happens, people will just be like, I don't know what to do. What did Joe Rogan say I should do? What did, what did Alex Jones say I should do? Uh, you know, what did Russell Brand say I should do? And then you could just sort of follow these key figures who have been established. And that's really what social media and I believe the social media and the internet are basically designed to set up the playing pieces for the cultural side of this collapse event. I mean, out of all the other things that they can do with it, spying and data harvesting and all that kind of stuff too. One of the big elements is to get these key players into position so that uh, when the collapse happens, you have what seems like a very grassroots organic response that these people are leading, but it actually was well planned in advance. And these people are like, it says here, they're disposable, they're expendable. So one of them can suddenly fall away and like, see, he couldn't have been, he couldn't have been a pivotal key player in this thing because he got canceled or he was banned off of a platform or he went to jail or he retired or he died, whatever it is. So, so, you know, you, you keep pointing to these figures as if they're important, but they're not. Well, no, that's the design of the network is to make it so that it can heal itself and pivot at any given moment to a different person. And so, um, there's, there's too many people to mention in this whole thing, but those are some of the big figures that I keep seeing. Um, this is all going to tie in with some sort of alien psyop too. Uh, you know, eventually, it, eventually. Yeah. yeah. I think it, I think it will. Um, it, it's, it's been interesting for me to watch the last four years unfold as an outsider. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the media space, an outsider and coming into this greater knowledge of how the world really works, even though I already kind of I kind of knew before how the world actually worked. But this has basically just been, you know, I told you so four years of I told you so I already knew all this stuff. Right. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people have a, a suspicion of what I'm saying. And that's what I found is that when you t when you actually give people the real information and the sources, they can go to look this stuff up themselves. It does just feel like it's okay. Now it's actually real. Uh, until then, I th I, I sort of I knew something was wrong. And that why are so many people saying the same thing out of nowhere? And you sort of get this vague sense of a coordination happening behind the scenes somewhere, but. Um, what I like to do is to actually connect those dots so that you can be like, no, it, it is, here's the documents and here's how they say it. And it's like, now, now, now that that's established, we can move on and we can actually talk about how to counter it or how to expose it and raise some more awareness, which is why I greatly appreciate you having me on the show because, um, you know, this is, I think the biggest and most important movement that is not being talked about. It is the biggest trend that is going under the radar. And um, we need many, many more people to start to look into this. We need people to confront their wives, their girlfriends, their sisters. A lot of women are getting uh, recruited into this without literally any resistance whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No one in their family or life will even tell them, have the decency to tell them that they're being recruited into this thing they're just like, oh, I just, uh, I'm just doing health practices. I'm just, meditation is just for my personal health. It just helps me center. And then, uh, you know, the next thing and the next thing, and it's this chain reaction. And the next thing you know, there are some, they're down the, the mystical rabbit hole. And uh, no one even stopped to tell them that this is bad. I mean, they might make fun of it, 
but that's not the appropriate response. Uh, you need to educate people on where this is coming from and where this is leading to. And so what's one of the things I was doing on TikTok was just basically like giving men who are sensible and, and see weird stuff going on. It's like, you have permission to expose this stuff. Like just, just actually call it out. And now if you have the sources and the information, you're, you're not just fumbling when you try to explain this to somebody. That's the thing. You, if you want to confront it, you have to know a little bit about what you're talking about. And this gets people to that next step where they can actually coherently argue against this stuff. And, uh, and you don't sound like you're throwing darts at the wall or speculating about some completely random thing because they, in their own words, say that it is a network that has no name and it's doing all these things and it's designed to be this anonymous network effect. And so it's like, okay, that's a fact. It's designed to hide in plain sight. Mm -hmm. So that you can be staring directly at it and not even realize it. Hmm. Or you can be part of it. You can yeah. literally be a member contributing to it and say, I would never agree with the Thule society and Nazi ideals. And I don't care about what the ancient Tibetans, you know, the Aryan race and this. I, I completely reject that. But I am interested in manifesting and, you know, meditation and these other practices and or I'm, you know, I don't believe the earth is round. And then because I believe I, a lot of flat earth stuff was when I was on TikTok, flat earth was exploding as a psyop and it was just getting more and more traction. And I would debate oh, still people. around. It hasn't gone yeah. anywhere. I, I would debate people and just uh, in my book, Fire in the Rabbit Hole, I have a chapter on the flat earth and just using simple logic, just debunking the entire thing. Um, if, if people want a little taste of that, I mean, one of the things is the, the moon being upside down when you're in Australia, uh, that wouldn't happen in a flat earth. You, you wouldn't have things seeming the heavens would just be a flat plane. You'd see the same thing from everywhere. Um, like there's just simple logic you can apply that destroys the arguments and they never come back and defend their positions. Because again, these people don't care about defending rational things. They're a post-rationalist movement. They're an anti, an, really an anti-evidence movement, an anti-rational movement that wants to submerge mankind into this dreamlike symbolic state of dreams and intuitions and follow your feelings and just trust uh, nature. Uh, you know, look at the sun and, and its beauty when it's the sun is setting and then it, it feels profound and spiritual and so therefore it must be this mystical thing we should worship and commune with and they're like they're actively moving against what is this equally dangerous pure materialism this hardcore there's no meaning to anything it's just we're just chemicals and and uh evolution and just humanism yeah the, the transhumanist um anti-spiritual facade that also doesn't hold up under scrutiny and then uh they want to be the the other side of that false dichotomy so you're supposed to pick one or the other and they're making the materialist side more and more obnoxious the the trust well, the science a lot of covid was yeah, about that because that's that's how they get to their techno fascist future by presenting those two poles of the dialectic to people yes. and having them choose so that they can create the synthesis Exactly. Yeah. The synthesis is, is technocracy, but it's a spiritual technocracy. That's a term that I used years ago uh, when I wrote an article for geopolitics and empire. Um, I, 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 I was using the term spiritual technocracy. It's not ruled by scientific elite, which is the traditional term uh, for technocracy. It is ruled by a scientific priesthood, which is a priesthood that is familiar with the science of spiritualism or the science of spirituality. So now it's not a religion that has a sacred text that has, that is open to everybody and can be examined and, you know, you can agree or disagree and we just all tolerate each other. This is now the science. So they're going to more and more DMT and the altered states of consciousness kind of thing. Uh, they're going to push consciousness and the science of awakening, the science of developing your third eye. And um, they might not use these terms, you know, because they don't care about the terms. Uh, but 
it is basically a spiritual technocracy and uh, that is the convergence after they've made one side so obnoxious and maybe they make the other side so obnoxious it could be that the new age becomes you know uh starts to you start to see it get exposed more and starts to get attacked more but i would suspect if that starts to happen that it's just more convergence where you're going to get the synthesis where we're now we're moving away from um the pure yoga uh meditation guru style of things towards a more sensible i think who would be a good example jordan peterson is sort of right in the zone mm. of being like he can talk about mystical things and no one really bats an eye um he gets very emotional he's very much trying to he's a cult leader in even if he's not trying to be in the just the, in the pure sense of this sort of deep emotional outpouring that he sort of brings out of people in his lectures and stuff and he'll talk about carl jung but he won't really get into the weeds of carl jung he'll just sort of reference it and then like he's sort of one of these guys that can do that balancing act of being very public and very open about what he believes and he's a free speech advocate i loved jordan peterson for years i i mm -hmm. thought he was the best thing to happen for uh, free speech and and rights for a long time and then fast forward a couple of years and he's talking to <laughs> and orthodox benzo addiction too don't forget the addictions about that. Yeah. the the you know the spiritual trip to russia and then he comes back as a russian orthodox um, mystic where he talks to jonathan pajot which is this mm -hmm. orthodox mystic who talks all about the icons and the symbolism of the orthodox church and that very is a slippery slope towards all of that christian mysticism um where you have the Bible is just an allegory for all this same stuff that Carl Tyker or not Carl Tyker. Carl Tyker is an amazing author that I uh, that helped co-write um, the New World Religion, which I'm a huge fan of. Carl Jung, uh, you know, you can slip it in Carl Jung into Christian mysticism and stuff because it all um, these mystics all supposedly at least share the same roots, um, and that's why that's what Theosophy's premise is: is that all religions are exoteric they are outward facing the public is able to see it and they're all seem very different but they all have a kernel of truth that if you pull on that and you go behind the scenes to the deeper mystical level they all share one mystical body of knowledge and supposedly that's like you know the source of all of that that's where you get like the emerald tablets and these sort of mm -hmm. references to ancient things that are devoid of any particular religion and so it's this yeah the emerald inter tablets the archons um you know all of that stuff all of the all the stuff that that we can uh talk about for hours and hours and hours we just can't actually offer you any physical evidence of it yeah that's yeah, that's no the one theme that i always see as a constant with mm -hmm. all of these people it's like they they'll They'll give you all the flowery language that they think you need in order to be convinced of its actuality. But good luck getting anything that that resembles proof. That is such a such a perfect uh, argument for this, because what happens every time is that they will make you feel stupid for questioning their yeah, cult. Which is sophistry. It's, it's basic sophistry. sophistry. Yeah and they will promote their thing this is why it works so well and i i got at this in my book fire in the rabbit hole um is that they need the cover of being an underground grassroots revolution where this is just kind of whispered about and you just hear somebody talk about it on a podcast and the the host doesn't really push back on it or if they do they very quickly retreat and you know they won't push the subject if you if you challenge them they will just either mock you or they will retreat they won't defend their position and show their sources and have an open debate about anything they need it to be a sexy uh like x files was a, a huge experiment in this is to x files is supposedly about fbi investigators i love the x files growing up. this is why i'm very familiar with it um but it's like it was supposedly about ufos and about the pentagon covering up 
secrets about the UFOs. But if you actually watch the show, I, I revisited it a couple of years ago when I was investigating this stuff. It is just hardcore new age propaganda disguised as FBI agents researching paranormal activities. There's a lot of ancient Navajo and, and Aboriginal traditions and stuff. They'll just seamlessly work in all of these ancient myths and cultural um, urban legends and, and this kind of stuff. And it's all about being explored through the lens of a science fiction show about a conspiracy of the military hiding these secrets. But it was actually basically an initiation into saying, look at all of these um, ancient secrets that, you know, if only we were brave enough, uh, we would explore. And it, it had that really, and they pick like the most attractive people they can to be the protagonists and they're, you know, FBI agents. So it's also sexy and it's like a government conflict that's happening. And they, they really did a good job dressing mm -hmm. it up as this yeah, very James Bond esque. Exactly. And, and they don't want a plain disclosure, open discussion. Uh, they want to leak things and then have this, mass of uneducated people who are just going along with it, which is sort of this, this herd like mentality that they want, they need the collective. Um, and then if you stand against them, against these many whispering people who have no sources, uh, you just look like a fool because um, no, nobody's going to provide a counter argument, but they'll all snipe at you. They'll all look at your, what is your credentials? What do you believe? And then they'll that happened to me all the time. And I mm -hmm. laugh it off. I enjoy that kind of stuff um, when I was- Or, or my TikTok. favorite, this is the new one. Tell me, stop me if you've heard this one before. What's your solution? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then again, so yeah, just flip it on the other person. And then, you know, it doesn't matter that you were just saying something insane. Uh, you know, now I say something very traditional and conventional, and then they just have this massive diatribe that they can all go on and pick apart by associating you with the Catholic church and, oh, the Catholic church had these, you know, in Canada, there was this scandal with uh, the, the, the schools with the natives that they forced in, the natives into these Catholic schools. And then they erased their heritage on these things. It's like, I'd be trying to def talk about something completely different, but these people would come into my comments and start railing against the, the residential schools in Canada, because I'm Canadian, and they thought that was like a big gotcha and stuff. And then when they realized that I was exposed in the Catholic church too, and I didn't like their crimes against humanity, the whoops, then they had to change topics and they had to go to something else. And so, but they would, yeah, they, it's absolutely true. They love to flip it on you and they don't defend their positions properly. And, and I think that what happens, what I've seen is that once you get down to this level of really informing people, um, you do see people change and you, and you start to make, real serious gains in the conversation because a lot of this is just about people not having the confidence to know how to even start to argue against it. And you just give them a little bit of tools to equip them to talk about it. And then they can do their own research. I hope people get the new world religion by Gary Kaw. Um, you know, if you want to get my books, um, you're going to get a lot of, uh, the Christian perspective, a biblical perspective. Um, and, uh, but also exposing QAnon and a lot of these other, you know, false movements to try to suck people into these rabbit holes. That's why my book is called Fire in the Rabbit Hole. Is a lot of these rabbit holes people go down are actually psyops and designed to merge at this point of the Aquarian conspiracy. Um, so if people are interested in that stuff, the, the material is available. I'm trying to give you guys sources. Um, you, you, you know, I don't want people to have to come to me for everything. Unlike these people who love to be the gurus that control, hold all the cards and they don't tell you anything about where they got their information from. Right. I'm the opposite, you know, go do your research. I'll give you good sources. And then from there, hopefully we see a whole ripple effect where, um, you know, I guess it is kind of like a spin, right? It's like, <laughs> let's have people pretty much, uh, everywhere it's talking. It's using, using their own weapons against them. That's, that's yeah, been that's one happened. of the mantras of Liberty Radio since day one. They gave mm -hmm. us all these wonderful weapons. We might as well put them to use. <laughs> I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me on, too. Yeah. It's uh, And all you your know, books got... are, uh, are linked on your website, wolfpox.com, correct? Yes. Yeah. My books are there. Uh, people are wondering when they go there. Um, the first two books I wrote, 
I, I didn't intend to write about any of this stuff um, originally. And then the pandemic happened and it was like, okay, they're kicking into high gear. The time is up. We have to just go head on and go right for the throat and, and deal with these people. Um, originally, I was writing about video games and I had a, a video game website uh, on the Metal Gear Solid series, which I which I find to be a fascinating uh, series because of all the conspiracy theories it deals with. Mm -hmm. But um, as well as the predictive programming included in the various entries. Yeah, and the creator is a Japanese guy who basically hates American imperialism, so he mm -hmm. tries to expose a lot of stuff ahead of time. And so I was doing basically a big biography of his works and his motivations behind his games, and it touches on a lot of the same stuff actually. I talk about HG Wells in there and stuff. I work it in to because I always intended to talk about this stuff. Uh, but I was going to use video game pop culture analysis to do do this stuff. But uh, then the pandemic happened and it's like, oh, I might have a year and a half to talk about anything before the infrastructure is collapsed. And, you know, this is all gone. No one knew how COVID was going to turn out. We didn't know they were going to lift the restrictions eventually and stuff like that. Like, And so uh, that's when I started to shift. And that's when I wrote Maybe Everyone is Wrong, a deep dive into Revelation and showing how you can see the symbolism in revelation but i i interpret it I, again maybe everyone is wrong includes me i could be wrong too but um it's a walkthrough of that and then i went on TikTok, promoted it blew up apparent for some reason i don't know why exactly is a hunger for this kind of stuff and that's when i it was exposed to so much i decided to write fire in the rabbit hole and since then i have a sub stack um that i publish a lot of stuff on a lot of Bible study, a lot of pop culture reference, talking about Trump and the election in 2024, what's going to happen. And that's winterchristian.substack.com. So Substack has been a really good platform. Uh, free speech seems to be very well protected there. I don't know of anybody getting canceled or censored there, although I don't do anything that should be censored anyway. But um, yeah, Substack has been really good. So if anyone wants to support my work and follow my stuff, you can sign up winterchristian.substack.com. Absolutely. And that is uh, linked down in the description for the stream as well for anybody who uh, wants to hit that up while they listen along. Um, we're closing in on uh, two hours, Terry. Uh, how how you doing? You getting winded yet? You know, once I actually get on a roll talking about this, I just never want to stop. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could probably talk for six hours about this stuff and just gut in, go into the guts of all this stuff. But uh, well, I'm not going to force I, you to do that. So I suspect uh, so that, that the readers have a lot to chew on already. Oh, and yeah. uh, there's and so there's I, a lot uh, a lot to dig into. Matter of fact, you've given me two books that I need to go and find copies of for myself for my own research. Um, so that, that's definitely a good thing there. Um, last question that I have for you this evening, I guess we can probably use this to, to kind of, uh, finish things out. Um, based on your research, based on your analytical skills, what do you see the remainder of this decade looking like? Hmm. Yeah, that's, I do a lot of writing about, I do what I call thought experiments on my sub stack. And I, I don't want to commit to any one idea of it, but I am always exploring what I think could happen. Um, in short, I would summarize it by saying that I think that we're going to have um, a, some sort of form of like a World War Three centered on Israel, of course. Um, I think that we're going to, Christians are going to get scapegoated and demonized as being responsible for uh, a lot of the Zionist colonization co uh, outrage that people have or the, the Gaza situation. I think that on the other hand, there's going to be this anti-Semitic movement that they're going to be associated with. Um, I think that uh, the economy, the U S dollar is already, they're doing everything they can to weaken it and, and, destroy it and collapse it. And once the dollar fails, you're going to have obviously uh, mountains moving. You're going to have wars and uh, 
and power struggles, um, China, Iran, the BRICS countries, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I was on, you you know, Hervoy Morich, uh, you talked with him. Um, I was on his TNT radio show for years as a weekly guest, and we would talk about this stuff constantly as what what's going to happen with, uh, you know, various details of the geopolitical game. But uh, I think that what's going to happen is that there's going to be a lot of false hopes being presented, a lot of false saviors being presented. I think Trump is one of them, the most obvious one right now. Elon Musk and Peter Thiel are sort of in the same camp. Um, what they want is to have a populist movement that is controlled by their people and um, can create this big tent sort of feeling that uh, the Trump doesn't really want to be associated with traditional conservatism. He's obviously was this, you know, left leaning person as a celebrity, as a private billionaire and all this stuff. Um, friends with all the Democrats and stuff of like that. And then when he ran for office, okay, now he's this populist conservative guy and stuff. And so I think what you're going to see is a lot of attempts to lure people into that camp. Um, the fake assassination on Trump is, is uh, you know, obviously part of that in my mind. I write about how I think that was a psyop and I don't think there even was a shooter. Um, but, uh, I mean, these are theories. You know, I'm not going to make any claims that I know anything. But oh, There's plenty of people on the Internet that will argue with you about it. That's for sure. But I, I do the thought experiment, right? It's like I could be wrong. I'm not arrogant enough to say that I know how the future is going to be. But – it's within the realm of possibility. And I think the warning signs are there that the critical infrastructure is being weakened and, and undermined to the point where there will be a collapse, right? That's what I'm getting at is that there will be a crisis. It will escalate. The dollar will collapse. And basically the U S empire will seem to collapse. And what happens after that is that you have this hard pivot, uh, maybe a soft pivot. I don't know. I, I think it'd be a pretty hard pivot into uh, population control basically under the guise of the green movement. Mm -hmm. um, I have a working theory that I ex explore in my books called the green world order. People know about the new world order, the idea of the global government. I think and we've talked about the, the spiritualized technocracy and how this ties with the Aquarian conspiracy. I think the Aquarian age slash con Aquarian conspiracy wants a one world government that is ruled by essentially the green movement. It's going to be an environmentally minded and um, presented as a solution to war, chaos, nationalism, all these things, but it's going to be dressed up in the robes of uh, environmentalism. And then you're going to have sort of a mother earth worship Gaia sort of uh, the idea that the, there's a world soul and that mother nature is, needs to heal and, there was this predictive programming movie called the uh, mother um, with Jennifer Lawrence. I think that's her name, right? Yep. Um, and it's all about mother earth, you know, basically getting pushed to the limit and not being able to handle all of the, the selfish uh, assholes who are occupying her house. And then she eventually, you know, whatever happens, burns down the house or kills them or whatever happens. This is massacre at the end. And, uh, and it's all a big allegory for what they're planning on doing to basically, uh, exacerbate the conflict in the world, have this unsustainable is their word, right? Is we need sustainable development. Everything has to be sustainable. So they need the current order to become unsustainable. So they need to destabilize what we have been doing for hundreds of years, the protections and safeguards we have, the constitution and the rights and everything that people enjoy currently, the freedoms we have and the checks and balances against tyranny as well. And then they can destabilize that, collapse it, and then have a sustainable future, which is going to be all justified under this green priesthood that I that I envision happening. Is this um, basically a new, not a proper church, of course, this decentralized network, but it's going to be this rule by um, whoever claims to be the most tolerant and the most open-minded and um I, there's a the most inclusive the most inclusive the yeah. most collectivizing 
the most un uniting because division is the great, the only sin in uh, their religion. And so to be independent and to be set apart and divisive is antithetical to everything they stand for. You need to be part of their movement. And the only way to do that is to create a massive trauma in the human psyche. Uh, Alice Bailey talks about this. Um, they basically need to have such a massive traumatic event in the world, which they hoped World War One and Two would be. They, they really believed that would be enough to change society forever. And these technocrats would just be able to swoop in and take over. Uh, but basically, essentially, only because of the Christian church and Bible-believing Christians. Like, I don't want to overstate the point, but I'm based on my research, the only obstacle for that reason that didn't happen in the 60s uh, when they had this whole hippie revolution, drug explosion, sexual revolution, you think about the amount of transformation they were trying to pump into society at that time, was traditional conservatives, Christians. It was Christians saying, not in my house, I'm not going to put up for it. The PTA meetings, the school boards, the Christians occupied a lot of the power there and they got very provoked and they stood up and they said no. So it has been a march since then to undermine Christianity, to make it look foolish, to um, have a lot of fake Christian leaders who end up being exposed as pedophiles and and corrupt politicians and all these things to basically undermine that and weaken the church to the point where they think, at least, that uh, the next time there's a giant collapse and a giant traumatic event that they will orchestrate, that uh, they can demonize the Christians in the process, blame them for everything somehow, and then... Uh, destroy them, like Barbara Marks Hubbard said. They're the pale rider. They're death. They <laughs> they have no problem saying this in their own private circles, um, and then basically wipe out Christianity, and then try to start over with this. Uh, and I think that's all could well happen within the next ten years. I don't mm -hmm. think that is uh, you know that's not a fifty year project. It's been a project since the eighties when you know. The Aquarian conspiracy was written. It's we're now seeing the culmination of that. We're starting to see it openly. I'm seeing more and more hostility to biblical Christianity from weird angles and uh, people that I know have, who are more popular than I am and have more engagement. They're seeing more and more pushback from strange places and demonizing Christians and blaming them for uh, for our current world situation somehow and. Uh, the arguments become very strained and, and bizarre and surreal, but anyway, that's how I think it's going to go. I think, and I and then I continue to develop these theories in my Substack, but uh, that's where I am right now. Well, I mean, um, you know, based on the the current instruction from the United States Department of Homeland Security about who they should be considering, uh, you know, a, a possible threat inside the borders of the united states uh i i think that's uh that's spot on uh, people who it, know their constitutional rights and believe yeah. in the bible are basically called domestic terrorists at this point so the the correct term is domestic violent extremists yeah oh is that yeah. okay <laughs> yeah dve uh if you nasty i, I didn't know they updated the terms on yes. <laughs> Yeah, memorandum as of what was it, June two thousand twenty-one, something like that. Uh, like I don't think Biden had even been in office six months yet, and they were like, "All right, these are the people we need to start going after now." Yeah, I'm on a which watch list uh, somewhere, I'm sure. Um, so I'm going to say whatever I can until then, and I'm not going to worry about. Uh, you know, it's another thing I write about often on my Substack is is not being afraid of these people at all, and. Uh, enjoying the process of exposing them and humiliating them and um, provoking them. I don't care. I'll provoke them into killing me. I don't care. Yeah. Well, uh, that's that's the whole thing, is if you allow the fear to, di to dictate how you are going to proceed, then they've won. Yeah. That's that's literally the only way that, it, that they can win. If you do anything other than that, uh, it's a loss for them. Yeah, so, they want you to censor yourself. Yeah. Um, you know that that that's their victory, and it's like, no, you're gonna have to shut me up the hard way. You know, it's like even if I didn't have any internet access, I would be out somewhere talking to somebody, and uh, um, I'm not gonna be violent. Uh, you know, the Bible says that our weapons are not physical; they're spiritual, and I'm a full believer in that. But 
um, you know, I will be a pain in their ass for as long as I'm alive. And so uh, that's that's my mission. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad somebody else out there has uh, decided to take up the mantle and I don't have to do it all by myself. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for for having me on. I uh, I suspect that you're going to get some, you know, pushback from certain people because this is is a pretty big nerve here with uh, that that tends to these people come out of the woodwork is what happens, uh -huh. and suddenly you find out that a, a large portion of your audience was on board with this. Uh, but um, I think that also once you plant the other seed, when you I think a lot of these people don't realize what they're a part of. And so it, even though they might react initially very negatively, I think over time it'll start to, they'll see it and then they'll start to click and then they'll move away from it. I hope. Hopefully that, that is, uh, that is the intention behind it. Uh, of course it could also have the opposite effect for some people where it actually just pushes them deeper into it, but then they, they probably were a lost cause to begin with. At least that's yeah. the way I look at it. Um, if they're going to uh, slip into the current that easily. Well, Terry, thank you so much uh, for taking so much time out of your evening to spend it with us this evening here on Liberty Radio. Anytime you got something new that you need to promote, man, uh, give us a shout. Let us know. We'll be happy to to bring you back on. Absolutely. There's There's nothing... You know, there's nothing I find to be a better use of my time than exposing this stuff and helping people to to learn and to uh, resist. And so uh, I appreciate it and I will be in touch. Awesome.